Okay, everybody, how are you doing? Uh, I wanted to introduce us uh, to the spinal cord and to motor pathways in our next step. And as we go through the spinal cord, I'm going to also touch on some of the sensory pathways that we didn't really describe very deeply in the sensory part of, the, of our study so far. So this is a little more neuroanatomy, but I think it's critical for us to be able to understand the neuroscience behind some of that motor function. So we're going to kind of get into that. So this close-up that we have here is a depiction of a spinal cord uh, being shown, and then these uh, spindly-shaped nerves that are arising from here are depicting uh, images of ALS struck um, nerves. These are usually much thicker and much more dense. But because of the loss of neurons in ALS uh, in the spinal cord, then these, uh, these nerves have become atrophied. So what we'll be doing is making connections to ALS and the basal ganglia and some other um, aspects of motor function and higher order motor function in the basal ganglia, for example, when we get to when we come back from our um, the tr uh, <laughs> when we come back next time on Wednesday. So let's go ahead and get started then. So if we look at the spinal cord and we take a, a cross section of the spinal cord here, what we can see basically over on the right side is this low um, magnification, if you will, uh, p a perspective of, of the spinal cord. And what we're doing is that we're basically looking as if we're uh, looking uh, at somebody and we can actually see only their spinal cord back here and then the spinal nerves and emerge from the spinal cord. And there are two different domains or aspects of this that um, arise out of the spinal cord. One is that we have uh, what they call this uh, dorsal root ganglion. This is being shown right here and feeds up towards this back area. If you think of the dorsal fin sitting towards the back, that's kind of the the area that's that's in. We also have the ventral root, which is then feeding into, uh, or actually emerging from, this ventral part of the spinal cord right here. And so this picture here, we can kind of, the main thing they want us to be able to do is to be able to identify that there are two different types of roots that make up these spinal nerves, and that these spinal nerves are peripheral nerves that then go on to either be uh, to innervate motor um, effectors such as uh, skeletal muscles and so forth, or they're responsible for bringing in sensory information and feeding it into the, the spinal cord itself. And so the thing that I wanted to kind of depict then is if we look down in this image here, if we took a cross section here and then looked at, at, at it, um, what this more anatomically correct kind of um, uh, sketch is trying to show us is basically here's our spine of the T3 vertebrae, this is the dorsal part of the, uh, like, think dorsal fin, if you will, the back of the, uh, the, the organism. And then here we are uh, looking at the spinal, uh, the spinal cord itself. And then we can see these kinds of roots emerging from or feeding into uh, this. Then one of the things that I want to be able to communicate about this and be really clear about is that there's um, the dorsal part of this is a sensory part. And the ventral part of it is a motor part of this. And so if we think of two, div uh, two divisions that are the most helpful in understanding how the spinal cord is actually organized, thinking of dorsal versus ventral is the best way to start. So that's one major kind of feature that we can see uh, uh, or that we can, we can appreciate. So if we go back to this where it's a little easier to see, we have the dorsal part up here and the ventral part down here. And we'll, we'll call this out a little bit more in uh, a few slides, but we want to basically be able to sort of appreciate how those are segregated. Those segregated compartments actually feed into the spinal nerve, and the spinal nerve, you can almost think of it as basically containing, you know, a two-lane highway where you have things going either north and south or east and west, depending on which direction you're headed. And, um, and so you have cars kind of going in two different directions and traffic going in two different directions. Information in these spinal cords is similar in that sense in terms of being able to go and provide uh, either uh, sensory information feeding into through the dorsal part of the, um, and the dorsal root ganglion feeding into the dorsal part of the spinal cord. Or you have motor outputs that then join and form, help form the spinal nerve itself. And so we can see this kind of uh, in here in this depiction, the anatomical depiction, where the dorsal root here and the ventral root here are merged together. But they carry information flowing in two different types of directions. 
So, okay, that's great. And then we can think about the spinal cord basically having, you know, these different types of vertebral uh, regions here, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. I'm not going to spend too much time on that except to just note that there's different axial levels there. And this is sort of a, a cross-section of one of the different um, levels that we have of the of the spinal cord. And I wanted to point out some of these different domains. It's a close-up, basically, of the spinal cord. And um, this kind of butterfly-like shaped kind of appearance here that's shaded here is to depict a where the cell bodies reside within the spinal cord. So these are where we actually have uh, neuron soma, neuronal soma, uh, uh, residing and sitting within here. And on the dorsal part, if we will, up here, this is where we have a lot of sensory information being processed. The ventral part, this is where the motor neurons tend to reside, either receiving information or sending out their efferents to form the ventral nerve. So um, some of the features that we have here, I'm not going to dig too deeply on in terms of identifying these different cell sci. Um, we can save that for if you take the, the neuroanatomy course. But the thing I want you guys to be able to appreciate is that there are these different types of divisions here. And then you will be asked to try to be able to uh, depict or draw in a general sense of where these things are actually moving um, up the, um, uh, moving along in this, uh, um, uh, up the their axis and so forth. So let's take a look at what we got here. A um, couple of divisions here. The dorsal median sulcus is sitting right here, helping to, uh, to divide these two different what are known as funiculi um, and uh, these major bundles. So this white area is representing fibers of passage. So no neural cell bodies in there. Instead, it's all the axons from neurons that are trying to communicate, either that they're sending information up to the brain, which is happening in this dorsal part, sensory kind of thing, or we're having uh, information coming down and feeding into uh, these motor neurons here, so from the brain to the spinal cord, which are being carried by this region over here in the corticospinal tract. So we'll see that kind of division uh, and as we go into these different regions, but this kind of uh, landmark right here helps us to appreciate and separate those two different sides of the, of the midline there. We also have the central canal, a ventral white commissure that helps to connect the two domains, and then the ventral median commissure. So this white matter part, um, I named some of these just in passing, but here's the dorsal funiculus here. The lateral funiculus is in uh, the region here. The anterior funiculus is over here. So again, just these are landmarks to help us try to get it. If you're in the neuroanatomy, you actually have to memorize that stuff. But uh, for us, what we want to be able to appreciate basically is that we have these different horns also that are part of, uh, or not only appreciate where those different domains are for white matter, but also within the gray matter that we have these different horns, dorsal and ventral horns here, and then the lateral horn here. So the dorsal horn is carrying a lot of that sensory information, ventral horn is a lot of that motor where we have motor cell bodies, like I said before, and the lateral horn here, interestingly, usually is carrying the sympathetic uh, or autonomic nervous system uh, cells that are important for helping to control um, uh, the uh, visceral types of, of efferents that we, um, and effectors that we have uh, for our heart and so on. Okay, so if we're looking at the spinal cord then, we kind of got introduced to one that looks like maybe around here in the lumbar region. And but they, what we can see is that if we look at cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, this kind of distribution of white matter, which is now shown as black here, but these fibers of passage here, and then the cell bodies that make up the dorsal, lateral, and ventral horn here are these different types of, um, that they change in their, uh, their proportion as you look along the neuraxis here, starting at the bottom here at the sacral and then moving up to the cervical here. This kind of uh, confusogram that we have over here is giving a lot of different regions that we don't necessarily have to uh, remember. But I'm going to kind of point out a couple of them just to help us be able to, or there's a few that we want to track and we do need to remember. And so I'm just going to help uh, kind of orient us to this uh, schematic here. So we're taking an image, maybe something along the, like what we have the lumbar region, and then we're just kind of pulling apart these different regions. Ascending and descending tracks. These are in the white matter. We're not paying attention to the gray matter at this point. And then we're looking in and just saying like, well, what do we got in here? So ascending means there's a sensory stuff coming up to the nervous system. And what we're going to track is basically two of them that we want to uh, talk about. And we talked a little bit about this in class, and I drew a diagram in class, but here we are again. And I wanted to dig into more detail because I think it's really important to be able to know this.
So the dorsal columns is what this is called, is made up of the fasciculus grassus and the fasciculus cuneatus, two different domains. So these dorsal columns, which is a major thing that I want you to remember, um, are carrying the type of uh, uh, sensory information that's important for light, touch, and feeling. Um, and so if you want to think of uh, uh, sort of if you brush your hands across and you're reading Braille, for example, or uh, just feeling uh, detailed types of uh, input that way, this is the kind of information that's being carried by these dorsal columns. Another one is shown over here in the blue, and this is the spinothalamic tract. We talked about this. This is pain. Uh, when we talked about pain before, we talked about this uh, tract, and we just covered it very briefly, but now we're seeing it pop up again where we can actually identify this ascending tract here carrying pain information. And you may or may not remember, but this is carrying information from the other side of the body. It crossed over here, whereas over here we were carrying information from this side of the body. If that's not clear, we're actually going to revisit this a little bit more in a bit, but I wanted to uh, introduce that to you. Okay. So now we're just looking at descending tracks and the parts that we have to remember here. Well, luckily for you, the ones that I want you to remember basically is a cortical spinal tract, which is depicted right here. And it's a lateral cortical spinal tract. There are multiple different tracks here that are really interesting and, and conduct and help control multiple different regions, but this is the one that we're gonna really gotta zoom in and on and focus on. So this is a um, it's a, that lateral cortical spinal tract. That's a descending tract connecting the cortex to the spinal cord, these uh, some of the cell bodies that we have here. So those are our ascending and descending tracts. And here we have that dorsal column pathway being noted again. We have fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus listed here. Uh, we're going to be uh, neglecting these uh, spin very interesting spinal cerebellar tracts here, but then pointing out the spinothalamic tracts there. So let's focus in on that dorsal column medial and meniscal pathway and, and get a taste of it. I said find, touch, and feel. And so a more uh, thoughtful way of, of putting it is here is find it and discriminate touch, vibration, and proprioception. And so what we're looking at then in this case is these uh, multiple different axial levels actually extending beyond the spinal cord and then moving up all the way up to the, from the thalamus all the way up to the sensory cortex. So let's take a peek at this. Um, again, this is, uh, this is kind of covering some of that sensory stuff uh, for obvious reasons. So within the, what happened? Um, within the, um, um, the skin, we have different sensory receptors uh, that are, are detecting and picking up on these uh, on, uh, on uh, skin or on changes that are happening on our skin here. So a lam uh, lam lameliated corpuscle, which is shown here, for example, is one that can, uh, there's a specialized type of ending that can happen in sensory uh, fibers that then can feed in. So we're gonna depict that with this blue box here. <laughs> but um, this, uh, what's happening here is that this kind of sensory receptor is gonna carry that information in and track it all the way back until it goes past this little dot here. And then it moves into and feeds into these dorsal columns. The dotted line is depicting these, whether we have the, um, the, the, uh, the fasciculus grassus and the fasciculus cuneatus, also shown over here. Those, fasciculus grassus and fasciculus cuneatus, are carrying fibers of passage that, were, uh, that originated here in the skin and then are going all the way up until they reach the, the caudal portion of, of the medulla and synapse onto distinct nuclei within the medulla. So that's a primary sensory neuron that's coming in and feeding in to, uh, to, those, uh, to that, um, that part of the medulla. So this little dot that I mentioned to you, sort of half in jest, is actually where we have the dorsal root ganglion. And we learned about the dorsal root ganglion and um, where that was by when we actually were looking at this image where we saw the dorsal root ganglion is sort of this uh, uh, you know, uh, bulge here within the spinal cord where we have a cluster of cells here. So there are cell bodies that are residing here, they're outside of the central nervous system, they're formerly part of the peripheral nervous system, and they uh, are the, where the cell bodies are the sensory fibers that pick up information from the body and then bring them into the ventral portion of the spinal cord. So going back then, to our uh, image, here, here it is, dorsal root ganglion residing here. So that's what's happening here. Let's track this guy up. Primary sensory neuron, tracking upwards, 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 synapsing here, in this case in the nucleus gracilis, and then that synapses, or that synapses, 
meets another neuron, so it's a second order neuron here. This is first order, second order. That second order neuron crosses over the midline, or decussates is the term, and then moves up through what they call a medial meniscus, and then uh, through up through the midbrain, and then synapses in the thalamus. In the thalamus, then, we have the third order neurons, and those third order neurons then go on to actually innervate the, the cortex. And so we talked a little bit about this in um, and the homeworks before, and it wasn't very uh, clearly uh, defined. So now we have another opportunity to kind of dig into it and make sure we, we get it. What's being shown here is that um, there's actually two different funiculi that we have here, or, uh, these fasciculus, rather, um, uh, that we have here uh, within the dorsal funiculi um, here. And so this fasciculus cuneatus, which is right over here, uh, a little more lateral to the fasciculus gracilis, is uh, carrying information that's coming up from the upper part of the body, whereas this is carrying the information from below T6. So, um, so these are, uh, uh, you know, segregating our sensory information coming into the body, and it's segregating and it's putting, sending it to a separate nuclei here that also decussates and sends its information to the thalamus, etc. For our purposes, we're not going to try to remember about that differences and what's happening, you know, uh, in the upper body versus lower body. We just want to remember that we have this and track back one of these kinds of pathways going up through the dorsal columns. That it synapses here in the in the uh, in the lower portion of the medulla. And that the second order neuron then crosses over, travels up this thing called the medial meniscus, which is just an aggregation of these different fibers that happen to travel together. And then go on up and actually synapse then in the thalamus, and then ultimately up to the uh, the cerebral cortex. So that's that region there. And if we go and we kind of track this out a little bit, this is going to reinforce a couple of things that we were just going through. So don't panic. What we're re what you're seeing here is relearning and reinforcing uh, what we just talked about a little while ago. Here from the leg below T6, for example, above T6 here, showing here until we get to the cervical region, which is carried by the cranial nerves, which we'll which we'll not cover. <laughs> but but this is all sensory information coming on and feeding into these dorsal columns here. We just want to remember that they go up, synapse in the caudal medulla. Those second order neurons could travel up the medial meniscus and on upwards. But what's kind of cool about these images is that we can see these different divisions within the spinal cord shown here, and the gracile fasciculus and the cuneate fasciculus, um, and how um, and how they're kind of organized here. And as we move up from this, uh, where we were in the spinal cord, up to the caudal medulla, for example, we can see some of these different, um, these, uh, these different, uh, the gracile nucleus here and here, the cuneate nucleus here and here, uh, and then how this cuneate fasciculus is kind of feeding into and meeting these sensory neurons here. Uh, the medial meniscus is actually where these second order neurons, where we have this crossing over, they feed into the medial meniscus, um, which is kind of being shown here, feeds in, and then travels upwards. That medial meniscus is present in the rostral medulla, which we can identify here, and then uh, present also in the pons and the midbrain. Luckily for you guys, you don't have to remember all of that, but it's nice to be able to see all, um, the, uh, the different images. So again, I'm, just, I'm not asking you to be able to recall or, or uh, to say where exactly these are, but I think this kind of diagram in particular is really helpful for you to be able to do it. So what do I want you to be able to do? In the homeworks, they ask you to be able to diagram, a simple kind of diagram in which you can actually be able to track through what's being carried, the type of information that's being carried up through the dorsal column medial meniscal pathway. And what we're looking at basically, and what I'm asking you to do is a simplified version of this. You don't have to even draw the, the spinal cord very <laughs> in this much detail here, but something where it's clear that we're having sensory input come in and feed in and move upwards here and it has to meet on the same side of the midline. Uh, it meets up that second order neuron. And then that, that second order neuron that we have in the caudal medulla crosses over and feeds up through the medial meniscus up to the thalamus and then from here up to the cerebral cortex. So when you do that drawing, you don't have to, be as, uh, you don't have to go through and sketch the anatomical details that you have here, but I am wanting to know where are the cell bodies and uh, when does it cross the midline and uh, what kind of axial level, just by the name of it, are we at? And so, uh, or do these events happen, like the caudal medulla, the spinal cord, um, and then we'll get to the thalamus here. Okay, so I hope that's uh, clear in terms of what we're looking for in terms and what you see in the homeworks.
So that thalamic region that we're kind of talking about here is uh, feeding into what's known as a ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, so VPL portion of the thalamus. If you remember, we had the, um, the in that sensory homework that we were that we had when we were uh, struggling to get, to get through all of those different components, they were sticking an electrode into this region and monitoring and detecting different types of proprioceptive input into that region. So really kind of cool to see that come in. These feed into the cerebral cortex where we have, uh, here's our central sulcus, our sensory information is being processed by the post-central gyrus over here. And um, it's, uh, we don't have to remember that's Brahman's area three, two, and one, unless you wanna show off to uh, your friends about that, but those are some of the regions that are part of it. So you can have damage to the dorsal columns that can happen with syphilis, for example. Um, so be careful. Uh, but obviously, there's treatment for syphilis now. But, um, but this is something that was really kind of an interesting kind of loss of these dorsal columns that would happen in the fibers of passage there that resulted in the sensory ataxia, uh, an impairment of proprioception, and uh, a difficulty actually discriminating tactile functions, sort of an ironic and sad uh, twist to a sexually transmitted disease. And what we're looking at then here is a, uh, is a spinal thalamic tracts, and these are the pain pathways that we were talking about before. These run differently. What we're seeing here is that we have sensory inputs here from the skin. These are uh, usually C fibers. You don't have to remember that, but it's sort of these fibers that are unmyelinated and carry burning sensation or temperature for that matter, um, and uh, carry them back in. Here's the dorsal root ganglion cells here. Synapse onto, at the level of the spinal cord, meet the second order neuron here. That's really different from what we saw before. Remember here, in these pictures, um, we saw this uh, fine touch and feel come in and it stayed on the same side, traveled up, and didn't meet its second order neuron until it reached the caudal medulla. And those went up this sort of dorsal columns right here. But this is different. Pain is doing something different. It's coming in, it's feeding into this uh, directly and synapsing in the cell bodies within the spinal cord itself. Those second order neurons cross over. So second order neurons are always crossing over. Um, in this case, they're crossing over at the level of the spinal cord. And they do so at this little commissure here and then feed into uh, the spinal thalamic tract, one of the ones that I pointed out to you before, that then travel up to the thalamus and then to the, the cerebral cortex. And so um, this kind of region has a, a domain that is a list hours tract in which we actually can see these, these pain fibers coming in and synapsing. So these are also processed by the VPL and this pain kind of information that's, uh, uh, that's uh, being processed there. So, all right. Um, you know, we've seen these different types of domains that we have here and, and the different regions, and we can see that they are being processed by the uh, somatosensory cortex here. Again, we're talking about this post-central gyrus in that uh, primary somatosensory area. So lots of similarities between these different, um, these different pathways. You want to be able to draw a simple kind of diagram for both that pain pathway, something like this without as much anatomical detail, and also uh, do that for, the, uh, for that fine touch and feel uh, dorsal column pathway that we're showing here. So, okay, great. Now, descending tracts, what are we into here? So here what we're looking at is the lateral cortical spinal tract. And what we want to be able to understand with that is that these are fibers of passage, again, no, no neuronal cell bodies here. And we're moving from the brain, from the cortex, down to the spinal cord. So ultimately they're going to come in, cut in, and then synapse onto motor neurons that are sitting within the ventral portion of the spinal cord. So the party that we've been thinking about before is all in this dorsal area, uh, and that was all about sensory inputs. We had this spinal thalamic uh, inputs in there, right? We were talking about how we get uh, pain inputs coming in, synapsing here, and then that goes up and forms a spinal thalamic tract. Well, now we're talking about the ventral pathway, so we have the lateral cortical spinal tracts. This is uh, fibers of passage from the brain coming down, synapsing onto here, into the ventral uh, portion of the spinal cord. And those then go and feed and form the, uh, um, the nerves, the spinal nerves that we have that are responsible for motion. So here's a really nice kind of diagram <laughs> that you can use and when you're asked to actually depict this, pretty simplistic. Uh, but it kind of it kind of covers a, a key part of this, and that is that we're looking at in this simple type of diagram. What we're able to appreciate is that we're starting up here the cerebral cortex, and this is uh, Brahman's area for the the post uh, sorry, the precentral gyrus, uh, 
of the um, of the cerebrum here. And those uh, fibers are really large, um, or those cell bodies are really large cell bodies in, located in layer five that then are um, sending their output down and uh, they project and they have a long way to go. They actually have to go all the way down to the spinal cord uh, and um, through this corticospinal tract, that lateral corticospinal uh, tract that we were talking about. Ultimately, they're going to meet those cell bodies in the ventral part of the spinal of the spinal cord, and those uh, cell bodies are then going to um, are those motor neurons there are then going to project out and synapse onto the skeletal muscle or whatever effectors they're actually hooked up to. So this is our cortical spinal kind of tract here, and the thing we want to be able to appreciate is not only where the bodies are, cell body here and a cell body here, but also that these uh, decussate or cross over at the level of the medulla. So there's this crossing over that's really important. And so for cases of stroke and things like that, where we want to talk about co uh, contralateral damage of, uh, and how that can impact how somebody's movement uh, is, is affected, this is uh, one thing that can be really useful in tracking. So, um, and this kind of just uh, lays out, it's not only just corticospinal types of inputs that feed into these skeletal muscles, but we also have lots of different um, axial levels that feed into it. But the main thing that we want to kind of track out and we want to be able to get that general principle is this kind of upper motor neuron that's being shown here feeding into a lower motor neuron. So these aren't called first order or second order because this is a motor pathway and so I guess everything's different. But um, <laughs> so instead what they describe them as being upper motor neurons which are coming from the upper portion or the central nervous system feeding into these lower motor neurons down here. Um, and so there's different types of rigidity that can arise from a damage that happens to the corticospinal tract versus other types of lower uh, regions here that are, um, are pretty uh, are interesting here. So if we have a lesion in the upper portion here, for example, we can get decorticate types of posturing where we have an intact um, midbrain that then can help to, uh, to control and uh, and, and uh, help patients out. And so in the decorticate type of thing, if we have a stroke there that may have happened that kind of knocks out some of that region, we see this upper extremity flexion and then we have this kind, uh, this kind of appearance here. The scary thing is if we move from decorticate to decerebrate where we see this extensor um, responses here where we actually are losing uh, we, uh, and we're seeing this kind of extension that's happening here rather than flexion here. That, when that happens, uh, that indicates that there's damage in the midbrain itself, and sometimes that's indic indicative of a progression of some kind of swelling event that's moved from being just in the decorticate region to actually including the decerebrate region. And when you knock out that area, the trouble is that then uh, you're also close to a lot of areas that are important for breathing, respiration, and so on. And so the patient's uh, prognosis is poor. So that corticospinal tract, then, what we're looking at is this layer five. If you remember, I talked about those different layers, and we talked about that in the sensory part, where we talked about all of that, like layer four, which we had all that input coming in and, and everything like that. That's awesome, and we can see that in the post-central gyrus here in this depiction. This is a cross-section that looks kind of like two fingers or something like that, a close-up of them, but what this really is is trying to show a cross-section of, um, if we were looking at um, the cerebral cortex, and the different layers that we have on the cerebral cortex. So here's the central sulcus being depicted here. This is pre-central and post-central gyrus. And what's kind of shown in this grainy photo here is that there's a density of these uh, cells present here in layer four. And then there's a density, but in layer five, it's really not that strong. And that's because layer four is getting a lot of input into that post-central gyrus, a lot of sensory input feeding into there. For the spinal thalamic tract, or I'm sorry, the corticospinal tract, what we're talking about is that this is where all the inputs come, or uh, where these motor neurons are arising, and where they ultimately then project down to the spinal cord as well as other domains, uh, like the bulbar region and other things where we have um, the, uh, the lower brain stem. So if we look at a close-up of those different neurons here, these are called Betz cells. They're remarkably large because in part because they have to project all the way down to the spinal cord. And so they have a, um, a correspondingly large soma to be able to help sustain the metabolic demands of keeping that kind of long and extensive machinery up and running. So that's the only thing I wanted to kind of point out about this. Um, I don't think that's going to be something I'm going to ask you about in the homeworks, but it is something that can be helpful. I do want you to be able to, uh, to be able to see and appreciate this kind of thing that we have here. And one of the things I want you to know is that as we move down from the cortex uh, 
and move down towards the spinal cord, which I depicted down here. Um, one of the things is that it's feeding down through this region known as the internal capsule. Lots of stroke damage can happen in here, so you have this kind of constriction of all of these uh, motor outputs here. And if you damage that area, you not only damage the basal ganglia, which we'll talk about here, but you can also damage fibers of passage moving from the cerebral cortex down to the, um, the lower part of the spinal cord. So these are feeding in and make, and ultimately then form, the corticospinal tract. Where do they do it? They do it after they move from the, uh, they descend out of the, the brain here, and then um, they're, uh, they sort of uh, form these little f fascicles that are present within the, uh, the pons here. And then they come together and clump together and form what they call these medullary pyramids. And these are relatively anatomically distinct domains that we have within uh, the medulla uh, that represent the corticospinal tract. So nicely com uh, compacted together. And in the medulla, that's where they cross over. They call them the decussation of the pyramids, another great band name. And what they have here is that they can, or maybe a song, I guess, but that crosses over and then feeds into this lateral corticospinal tract. This also talks about some maintaining the same side as a ventral corticospinal tract, which I'm not going to ask you about. But this is a major thing that I'm going to want you to point out. So I've added to your work a little bit. Before, I was talking about this really simplistic diagram here coming down and feeding in. Now I've added in a couple of things. I want you to know about that internal capsule region, which is right about in this region, <laughs> uh, if you will, and uh, just being able to name that. And then that this is happening in the medulla, and that it's decussating or crossing the midline here and feeding into this corticospinal tract. Okay. So then... Um, and if we track this down, we're going to watch these as we move down. But this, uh, this kind of gives you an anatomical picture, but not necessarily one that I'm going to ask you to remember. But I think it can be kind of cool to see. So at the level of the midbrain, we have these cerebral peduncles that are part of uh, the blue is indicating where we have these corticospinal tracts. So it feeds in from the internal capsule into that midbrain region. And, um, and then if we want to see uh, how it looks in the medulla, pyramids here are shown from this perspective. So we're looking at the brain as if we were looking at somebody from uh, so uh, and face and they were facing us and if we could see their pawns and ignore the rest of the body that's in front of it and also see the medulla that's sitting there we would see these kinds of protrusions here that are known as the pyramids sticking out from the rest of the body here and you can see in a cross section how bulbous in appearance these uh, kinds of things are and uh, they describe it as being a pyramidal type of shape that we have there. So a fascinating kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, appearance of this stuff. And so what's happened then is um, we're at the level of the pyramids and that's where we start to see the kinds of uh, crossing or decussation that's happening. And in fact, I think it's this image, maybe it's actually a little bit lower, but you can see sometimes a fuzz down this area where this really clear line here gets a little fuzzy and that's where the fibers are actually crossing over. Whoops, I don't know what that is. Um, so, um, oh, well, you can't see it, anyway, trust me, uh, that's true. Um, so now we have these decussation of the pyramids here forming that lateral corticospinal tract, and that's shown in blue in this cross section here. So um, we're going to uh, sort of neglect the ventral corticospinal tract and its action here. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting is that if we look at ALS, and we'll talk more about that when we come back in, in the classroom, is that we have this kind of damage uh, to these motor um, uh, inputs that are feeding these upper motor neurons that are feeding into the spinal cord have lost their um, fib fibers of passage there. And you can see how dramatically it is. Sensory stuff is spared. Here, this is the dorsal columns where we're carrying pain, light touch, and everything like that. But the motor region, where you, if you're staying for those fibers of passage, indicates that there's a loss of those fibers in that case. Or they're no longer present here and here, indicating that ventral and, dor and, and lateral corticospinal tract. So in ALS, then, um, what is, uh, we can also see this kind of depiction of those loss of lateral corticospinal tracts as well. And damage to the numbers of lower motor neurons that are present in this region too. So when we come back and get together again, we will talk about ALS and describe all of those different aspects of ALS.
and we'll talk about how um, the uh, the um, you know oh, the the uh, some of the uh, mechanisms of action for ALS that are that are thought to be out there, and then finally what um, the basal ganglia, and we'll review the basal ganglia as well. <laughs>